for everybody that's listening online, uh, let me guess, is Sheldon here? Yeah. Oh, man, my entire day was good to us all, Sheldon. I mean, hi, Sheldon. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> the mic wasn't muted. <laughs> so, mine was it? No, mine. My, I, you know, I, I love you so much, Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do anything about it. <laughs> I give her a hard time. I, I do. She gives me a hard time. I gotta, you know, share it, share it here. So, uh -huh. but uh, <laughs> but no, Stefan will not be here tonight. Like I said, he ended up he had a uh, a stomach bug, and I did not want to risk it because uh, I have a very strict policy, especially when people are sick. Not coming up here. So I told him go home. And uh, sent him home and he is rescuing. So, uh, which is fine because I actually enjoy this lecture. This is one of my, my favorite lectures. So, uh, Mr. Travis, if you wouldn't mind, thank you, sir. So, tonight we're going to be talking about, uh, the, we're going to list the details that are included in a sales contract. We're also going to describe uh, the process of an offer and acceptance of a sales contract. We'll further explain the process involved in making a counteroffer. We'll further define the statute of frauds like Mr. Grossman had been talking to you all about, as well as the parole evidence rule. Um, and then we'll also identify the different types of personal and financial information that may be included in the sales contract. We'll further describe the three methods uh, that are used for legal description of the property We'll discuss the financing information that should be included in a contract, review the purpose and disposition of earnest money, and ex or discuss the ramifications of the default and a breach of contract. So if I'm correct, Travis, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the last lecture, how long did I spend on whoop, that slide right there? Uh, about 48 minutes. <laughs> Just on the first slide. So uh, I watched his old one and I was like, he, he just keeps going. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that tonight, I promise you. Um, but the, the process, the reason I spend so long on this is because of the fact is, is that you have to understand what offer and acceptance is. Does that make sense? You good? You don't feel good? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. My blood pressure should not run from that. I've been feeling dizzy for like the past three hours. Do you need some water? You need some water. Okay. I'll be good. You good? Yeah. Okay. Give her a test. Go ahead and we'll take care of that. Oh, yeah. So, in that situation, like we said, we also, by the way, we have a recliner in the front of the recliner back to you lay down. Just in case. Just in case. You don't make that drink red. Oh, no. Well, we got plenty of we have plenty of water. It's just there's a lot of stuff that works, and I think that's just like fun. Uh, can I get to you? Yeah. There you go. We got plenty of stuff. Do you want a fan on? Because I can get yeah. your fan on too. I know how that goes. Yeah. Been there, <laughs> been, there, all been, there, so. been there, done that, girl. Oh. There you go. Is that good? Because it is hot in here too. So, all right. Perfect. All right. So, in this situation, when we're talking about offer and acceptance, um, like I said, in this situation, when we deal with offer and acceptance, an offer is going to be in a situation that, for example, if I need something to be done, say that, Ms. Vita, I want you to end up, um, I want to buy your house, so I make you an offer, okay? Now, everybody always asks me this question, how do you make an offer, okay? You know how you do it? You know that, I, I think you talked about it earlier, the one to four family, the contract, that's how you submit the offer. That's exactly how you submit the offer. There is not a form, you're correct, Travis, mm -hmm. that says offer. There is not an offer form. There is no such thing. It is you're going to fill out the contract, and I'm going to send it to you. And you're going to get it, and you're going to look through it, and you're going to say, green light, red light. You see what I'm saying? If you say red light, that means you're counter offering me. Okay? But eventually, that's always going to happen. I'm going to send you a low ball offer. You're going to counter it, and I'm going to counter you, and we may go back and forth. 99.9%. Yep. Oh, yeah. But eventually, where are we going to get to? We're going to get to acceptance. I'm going to accept, or you're going to accept my counter, or I'm going to accept your counter. One of the ways we're going to accept. So, 
It is going to be the offer and the acceptance, okay? Now, the statutes of fraud. Go ahead. I'm moving along quick. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It's a Friday. Right? And we might get stoned in. Right? We have, we have, and I'm, I'm making sure we're safe and going to be kind of going good this time. Right? So we're going to kind of hit this because we still do have the lecture online for my previous one. So y'all yeah. can watch that too. So we're, we're doing good here. Now, in regards to the process, now, Mr. Mr. Stahl, what exactly is this whole thing about a statute of frauds? Uh, basically, any real estate contract must be in writing in order to be enforced. So let me ask you, if I go over here to Ms. Vita and I say, hey, let me buy your deal and we shake hands, that's that's enforceable, right? Are you sure not in Texas? We go sure? with your gut. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it needs to be in writing. In order to we actually had a situation that actually happened in Austin. One of my agent's dads listed his grand, or excuse me, his grandma's property, but his dad's mom's. And uh, a wholesaler went up and was like, I'll buy the house for me for $800,000 and they shook hands. But then he went and got a higher offer for 850 and signed that offer. The other one was a handshake. That person threatened to sue him and everybody was like, okay, yeah, you might've had a meeting of the minds, but where's the terms? And they did hire an attorney and was actually going to try to do it, but nothing ever happened to it. So the real estate just has to be in writing, but like the normal, the anything other. So you want to buy this fan? This uh -huh. And you say, I want to buy this fan from you, Justin. Okay, shake hands, $5. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Because it's personal property. Yeah. But real estate, you have to have documentation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Good question. So, Another thing is, is the parole evidence rule, okay? And it states that the oral agreements, promises, and inducements made by the parties prior to entering into a written contract, so that me shaking your hand, okay, prior to us going into a written contract may not be used in a court to dispute or contradict some written provisions expressed in the contract. So I go shake your hand, and say I'll buy your house for four hundred thousand dollars, and then we get a contract, and I write three fifty. You can't turn around and sue me and say you said four hundred, because what did we just say? The parole evidence rule says you cannot do that. Okay, that's why whenever I go through it, my poor agents here, Travis knows, my poor yeah. mother drives him crazy. Okay, she drives him crazy for good reason. <laughs> yes, she will call you and call you and call you and call you, and she will say you didn't dot that I and you didn't cross that T and you didn't. And trust me, she does it to me too. Okay, that's right. Right. And so in that situation is, it's, it's very much a situation of like, it, she calls a lot, and it, sometimes you're just like, oh, I know, I'll do it, whatever. But but oh, if, but if she didn't cover my butt, I'd be. I've been, I've been sued five times by now. Like, it's one of those things like, she, she doesn't, she's That's what I told her. I was like, I would rather them hate you than love you and then we get sued. I'd yeah. rather you them hate you and just let it be like that. If you're mature enough, you know what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, but the key thing comes into um, this is that the writing, okay, it has to be in writing to be enforceable. In the, in the in the contract. Yeah, and it cannot just be a text message or a text message. email. A text message that. doesn't count. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Because what if I text you? I'll pay four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, we're talking. And then I put the contract three fifty. Yeah, the contract is the contract, so that that takes precedence over time. Now, what are you going to say about it? So, court, you're going to say, but your honor, he texted me four hundred thousand uh dollars. -huh. And what am I going to say? Your Honor, it's still <laughs> parole evidence rule. We signed this contract. We're safe. Okay. So in that situation is, it cannot contradict. Okay. Um, a letter of intent is often used, however, so very, let's just put this, that much, very, very little in residential. However, a letter of intent in commercial happens a lot. Yeah. Okay, so we don't really go and if Miss Davenport, you have a listing, I'm not going to say, Miss Davenport, my client Travis, we're going to submit a letter of intent to you. 
in this market, I don't have time to draft a letter of intent. It's going to be, Ms. Davenport, I'll get you the contract here in just a little bit. Because I don't have time to go draft all that and have a formal process. i got to get it to it. Okay. So the chances of you seeing this in residential, slim to none. Very slim to none. Unless, unless it's just dead. And then everybody all of a sudden wants to be, they're about to get audited or something, or your company, or then they're going to do everything by the book. Okay. But 99% of the time you don't see it. Okay. And most of the time, if it's a, if it's a caught a letter of intent or a contract, they're not really supposed to discuss terms. So Justin's the selling agent, I'm the buying agent. I can't just text them and be like, hey, my clients are taking 300. What do you think? Yeah. Because if you, I mean, if it's like, when you post, it. if you, yeah, a lot of times you will get that and people will respond with, sounds good, or yeah. actually, we're not, we won't accept that or whatever. But for the most part, you're supposed to go, text I can't can. talk about that unless it's in a one to four family, like you send me even an offer. <laughs> so I, can't, I can't talk about it. So. Because again, a text message is not a contract. Yeah. So, Ms. Davenport, me and you back and forth, we work out the terms. You're representing Ms. Vita, I'm representing Travis, we're texting back and forth, and then all of a sudden, you know, we come, we come to an agreement, okay? But then all of a sudden, her best friend decides that Ms. Sheldon wants to buy her house in cash, and then now all of a sudden she comes to you and says, okay, I got a person who wants to pay cash, so I'm going to go with that person. Well, then I'm going to say, well, wait a minute, we're in agreement, here's this deal, and what's the judge going to say? It's not a contract. It's not a contract. So that's why it's always best if you're going to have things that you say, if I send something to you and say my client wants to buy it, Ms. Davenport should text back to me and say put it in writing. Right. You see what I'm saying? And then in that situation, now we have a contract that we're working on, if that makes sense. Now, equitable title. Now, equitable title comes in, in, now you have two types of title. You have legal and you have equitable. Okay? Legal title, all right, legal title is when you own the property. So, say for example, Ms. Vita and Ms. Davenport, you probably both have properties that you own. You have legal title. But you also have equitable title, which means that you have the right to possess, be there, do your enjoyment, all that stuff. But when you go into a contract, during the time in, uh, between the contract's acceptance and closing, the buyer takes that equitable title from you, okay? Because that buyer has to do what? Well, number one, that buyer has to go in and that buyer has to do inspections. That buyer has to maybe do some other things, just kind of due diligence and stuff like that. So they have to have a right to do what? They got to be able to go on that property without being a trespassor. You see what I'm saying? So equitable title in this particular situation allows for them to be able to do that. Okay. However. Yes. Okay. You said they take that from the south. They have a right to it. We'll okay. put it that way. Okay. So they both share that mm -hmm. title equity. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's basically that allows them to do their inspections and things of that nature. Okay. But it's only once a contract has been accepted. Yeah. Cannot be before, and if it's terminated, it can't be after. Okay. I don't. I know. I just said that for a second, but that I don't want to talk about this. But that covers if I'm buying your house, we go under contract. You can't go and just smash up the walls because yep. it's not technically my house yet. That's right. But I'm still, you know, I can still buy it or whatever. That covers where that is. I still have an equitable title in that property. So you can't go destroying all my like my future stuff. <laughs> and it's reasonable too. Yeah. In the situation of, I can't just be to come to your house at one in the morning and do inspections. Yeah. It's got to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can't do those kinds of things. Now I do have clients that think that they can go in whenever they want. And I'm like, you haven't bought it yet. <laughs> it's not <laughs> yours yet. Okay. So now coming back to that, the document that we use in this business is basically the one to four family, okay? And it creates the conditions for the closing. So we will, in Mr. Stahl's class, you will be going through breakdown of every single element of the contract, okay? And we will actually go through every single paragraph in detail, okay? Now, it's that, a lot. it makes it so much easier. <laughs> it's 10 pages, I believe, now. Yeah. It was, when I first started, I think it was like six or seven, and now it's 10. 
every year, or not every year, every other year or so, it, it keeps adding more. But uh, basically, it creates the conditions for closing. Okay. It also is now. Now, of course, you gotta love love tests. Miss Davenport, I know how much you love tests. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. You ready? So not only is this document called the one to four family residential contract, but guess what we also call it? An offer to purchase, a contract for sale or of sale, or a purchase and sell agreement. So when you're reading your test, or your question, hypothetical, do not be surprised if they don't throw one of those terms in there. Do not be surprised if they don't throw one of those terms in there. Okay, because I can tell you almost certain that they will, and they will do that. Okay. So it would be like a point also. I mean, well, they'll say something like to the extent to, to throw you. They'll say something as Travis uh, wants to put in an offer on Justin's property. Travis needs to submit what type of contract. Then they'll end up. They'll give you three choices, and then they'll throw in there a purchase and sell agreement. Or they'll say an offer to purchase. Or they'll say a contract of sale. But you're going to have to know that that equates to the one to four bank. Does that make sense? Okay. They're just, just like we talked earlier in this week, they throw in a lot of different terms just to trick you. Just to trick you. Okay. So you have to be prepared for that. So what is an offer versus the contract? Okay. Well, an offer. Well, actually, Travis, explain what is the difference between an offer and a contract? I thought they were the same thing. I mean, I'm signing, I'm filling out the contract. Yes. Why isn't it the same thing? It's very annoying. But it is an offer until it has been signed by all parties. Once it has been signed by all parties and they have been notified, then it becomes even then under contract. Wait a minute. You're telling me. Uh -huh. That if I see Miss Vita's property mm -hmm. and she's got it for, for two hundred fifty thousand listed, mm -hmm. and I submit a two hundred fifty thousand dollar contract mm -hmm. and I give it to her, that means I'm under contract, right? Not at all. Why? Because the seller hasn't agreed to it. You haven't signed. Because what could happen, Miss Vita? You got. By the way, I just found out that Giovanni's a millionaire. Okay, and so, 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 so this is Giovanni out here is a millionaire here. We're all going to eat. And he ends up, he loves your house. So I submitted your house on the market for 250 and I submit exactly what you asked. I put in a contract. Giovanni wants your house, so he wrote $300,000 and submitted it. Don't you want time to be able to make a decision? Exactly. So that's why the thing is, is that just because I send a contract does not mean that it's actually a contract. It's an offer. Okay. And let me tell you, let me tell you, I actually, I'm, I'm part of a group with a bunch of brokers. And uh, somebody was telling me the other day, the first time ever in California, they had a million dollar over list. And what that means with somebody listed their house, say at $500,000, and a person came in and bought it at $1.5 million. Where are they at? Okay. Oh, yeah. Came in over a million. And we just recently in Bryan College Station had one that was 60000 over list. So in that situation, just like Travis was saying, if I submit to you 250000 exactly what you said, here you go. Here's everything you asked for. Does that mean you just want to stop taking offers? No, what are you going to do? Travis, if you were representing Ms. Vita, and I give you exactly what she asked, and you got other offers, are you just going to say, oh, well, this is the one. What are you going to tell those other offers? We have multiple offers, so we're going to submit your highest and best one. So in that situation, now he's he notified everybody. So now Giovanni finds out he had put in 225. Well, he's just got noticed that highest and best. Yeah. So he says 300. And you can't give certain, you can't give terms of it. You can't say like we have a contract in at 250. Yep. 
So if you want it, please submit an offer higher than that. That's right. You can say we have multiple offers. So everybody There's submit your highest and best offer. And I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. And yes, it does. It does. Oh, it does. And I'm going to get into that here in just a second. I want to yeah. talk about that. So this actually happened. So say, for example, that Ms. Sheldon decides to put her house up on the market. Okay. And Ms. Sheldon, Ms. Sheldon, you put your house on the market for $300,000. That's what she's done. Put it up for $300,000. She ended up, she's got four offers. She's got four different offers that came in, all of them under $300,000. And Ms. Vita, you're representing Sheldon. Sheldon comes to you and says, well, what do you think we should do? What would you do? What would you do? I would tell them exactly what you said. We have multiple offers to invest in. There you go. You go back, even though they're under the list, you go back to those people and say, we have multiple offers that are on the table. We would like for every one of you to end up, we want every single one of you to end up going over and we want for y'all to put in your highest and best. Now, what if Miss Davenport is an agent of one of those offers and she calls you and says, hey girl, how are you doing? We got lunch all the time. You know, we're besties. You know, we're good friends and all. What's the, uh, what's the highest offer you got? Can you disclose that to her? What are you going to do? No. <laughs> can't do it. You can't do it. I know you know. You, you can't do it. You can't. And let me tell you, it happens a lot. You know, because you become good friends with people. Right, yeah. But you cannot, you got to know, I'm, you have to tell her, Miss Davenport, I'm sorry. I cannot tell you that. All I can tell you is this is what it is. Now, when could you tell Miss Davenport what the highest offer is? Everybody else declines, and they're still on the offer. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. You don't know. If Sheldon tells you that it's okay to share with her, okay. If Sheldon, because who's benefiting from this? Sheldon. So Sheldon might actually want you to say, because I've had this happen before. I may say to Miss Sheldon, you know, yeah, it's the seller's offers. Yeah. I, I know. So Miss Sheldon may say. In a situation now, you you've got to be careful how you word it. But how I would have done it, if I had four under list or four yeah four under list, I would have said, Miss Davenport, let me just say this: we have some offers that um, that are that are where they need to be in regards to the list price. Did I say we're at list price? Did I say that we're above list price? Did I even say we're below? But what is Miss Davenport going to say? What are you going to say if I say that, Miss Davenport? Are we pretty close to the list? Right. Maybe above? Yeah, maybe. Right. So if her client is at, say, 280 and we're at 300, she's going to go back to her client and say, well, they just talked to me and they didn't really tell me the numbers, but, you know, they it's a hot market, so they're probably at $300,000. So y'all need to put in 310. And next thing you know, guess what happens? Now you got Miss Davenport that has got her client submitting at 310. Then Giovanni goes and he gets his client put in at 315. And now all of a sudden, all, this whole thing goes from very bad offers to all of a sudden very good offers. Okay. But you can you go out though, Travis? Let's ask you. Can you go out and just say, uh, yeah, yeah, Miss Davenport. Uh, yeah, we got four offers. Uh, one for two eighty, one for two twenty one, one for you know this and that, and and uh, we this is what we got. Can you do that? Yeah. No. Only way you can do that is if your client tells you. Okay, your client has to tell you. So again, it's very key in these situations that you understand how these work. Okay. I've dealt with a lot from the buyers. Mm -hmm. uh, I've dealt with multiple buyers who. You go to put in an offer, and they're like, "Well, what's the highest one they have so far?" Well, no, 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 no. well can you find out? No, nope. no, we can't. <laughs> so we're gonna have to put in. Like I heard, they have multiple, so we just have to put in the best one we have. Mm -hmm. I do you think this will do it. I have no idea. We have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> can you ask? Can you ask your client if it's okay for you to disclose that information? If you are representing, so I'll tell you how. To, I took a gamble on one, uh -oh. and uh, and I take gambles when I need to. Okay. And uh, I had one that was kind of close. My client really wanted the property, okay? And uh, I went over and I said, um, I was like, you know, I have this issue. 
and I'm ending up, you know, my client really wants this property. Is there any way I could get a copy? Because here's what I was thinking. They told me that they had an offer on this property. Okay. I knew if I asked them, what's your, what's the offer price that they weren't going to tell me. So what I did was I said, can you send me a copy of the first page? I just want to copy the first page so I can see if it's actually a legitimate one. You can mark out the names. I just want to see that there's a contract. Can you send that to me? I was taking a shot in the dark. Taking a shot in the dark. They sent it to me. Guess what's on the first page? The price, the price that they're offering. Right there, I got my price, knew exactly what it was. Boom, I knew we literally went up, I think, over a thousand dollars since we were done. So, that's why you got noble realty. <laughs> okay. it's, it's just basically, and I'm not going to say it works all the time, but sometimes in this industry, you got to take a chance and just see. Because if they are a senior agent, they're not like if they've been in this a while, they know not to do that. Yeah. But if they're a newbie, if they don't know what's going on, they may just, if they're busy, because in real estate, you're running all over God's green earth. They may simply be like, yeah, I don't see no problem with that scent. Well, technically, that's a violation on their side, yeah. not on my side. So if somebody mm -hmm. comes back, who's it on? They weren't supposed to do it, not me. Okay, But do I recommend that? No. I don't recommend you going out only if it's a last resort. Okay, I try to play everything as close to the laws and, and keep everything as compliant as possible. Uh, but you always have to make sure you sometimes got to think outside that box. You know what I'm saying? Now, Sheldon, what's bilateral? Well, by I know means two. <laughs> okay. So how many? Um, how many? Uh, how many parties then are there going to be? Well, two. Two. So we know. That bilateral is going to have two parties. Now, Giovanni, my question for you: Who are those two parties in a contract? The buyer and the seller. Exactly. Exactly. Now, Corey, who is making the promise in the first one here under purpose? Who's making this first promise right here? Under the first part to and who's doing the I promise to buy? The buyer. Exactly. And Letitia, who's going to be the promise to uh, to sell? There. Yeah. Letitia, can you hear me? I'm sorry, my computer's kind of slow. You're good. You're good. It's going to be the promise to sell. Um, I'm not sure. Let's go to that last word right there. Sell. Who would be selling their property? The buyer or the seller? The owner. The seller. There you go. You got it, girl. So in that situation is, you see kind of how this all works together. Yes. Yeah, go. I'm just saying. So go for it. one thing it says here under this second uh, dash that right here is very key is that offer becomes a contract when the last party is signed and the other party has been notified. So why is that important, Trevor? Because if Justin sends me an offer and I we accept it, so I sign off on it. Let's do it like this. It. Let's for them to physically see it. Okay. Here's a here's a contract. Travis is sell or selling his house. I got a contract, we counter back and forth, I sign, everything's good, and I send it to Travis. Okay? Now I'm over here in my office, he's in his office. Travis, what do you do? I go, sweet, I got it, and I send it to title. What's the problem? He didn't know you. I have no idea that she, he, he's done anything. <laughs> so here I am over sitting here waiting on Travis to, to sign and to, to notify me. In this situation, I'm still thinking that I don't have a contract. And here goes days of your auction period. That's right. Your earnest money turned into your auction. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> See a problem? If they didn't communicate with you, then what would happen then? Well, that comes back to the situation of it's your job to stay on top of this stuff. Oh, so you would have to... If you ever sign, like I tell people all this time, you have a job as a real estate agent to stay on top of this. Okay? So imagine that it wasn't just me and Travis. Say I was representing you. Okay? And you signed that contract. And I sent it to Travis, who's representing Miss Davenport. Okay? So Travis had Miss Davenport sign. Miss Davenport has sent it back to Travis. Travis sends it off to title. Aren't you paying me to do something? Yeah, you're expecting me to do what? Follow up with this guy. Okay? And if I'm not following up with him, am I doing my job? No, I'm failing. That's why I always, what I always do just to keep that easy is every time I send a contract over, I give a time frame. Or like, I'll just say like, hey, we, it appears our offer, whatever, please let me know what you think by tomorrow morning or something. Because yeah. I know sometimes you can't do it, you know, right then or whatever, they might be busy that day, but right. let me know what you think by tomorrow morning. Because that way when I call them the next morning, it's not like I'm calling out of the blue being like, where's my stuff? It's like, I told you. You know, it's like they, they expect me to follow up by tomorrow morning. So either get it back to me or they expect me to call and ask what's going on. So. And I'll tell you one other. I mean, everybody has. That's one way. Yeah. I have it where I'm a very busy person, as everybody's known. Really? Just a little. Just a little. Just okay. a little. Just yeah. a little vacation. <laughs> I would have known as fast as you respond. <laughs> <laughs> I, I set up actually a reminder. Mm -hmm. So I would actually tell Travis, hey, man, how long do you think it's going to be for you to get Miss Davenport to sign? Oh, it'll probably be tomorrow. Okay. So I will go in my phone to my text, and I will text a message to Travis, and instead of sending it, I schedule it. Yeah. And so then at 9 in the morning, guess what happens? I may be busy, but he just got a text message. So he's going to have a text message at 9 in the morning that says, what's the status? And then what's that going to end up doing? It's going to, he's going to message me back and say, the status is this. And if I've been busy, oh crap, I forgot about that. It's reminded me. Yeah. Okay. You have to be able to do those types of things in this industry. You're going to have to. But yes, very good. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, too, how it says oral notification is of written acceptance is adequate. I don't like to take that. Yeah. It is adequate, but I don't trust it. <laughs> so just because you know he can send me a contract i can go send it to title and then just call them and be like hey we're good or, you know whatever i don't have any proof that that did happen and so even if he sends me that i'll ask i mean because you can get a text message at this point because yeah. that's just them saying we signed it and it's going to title so at this point a text message will work for that and so i'll just say like cool send me a text let me know it's on its way or whatever right. or send me an email and I'll tell you all this as well. In real estate, they always tell you there's three words that you always have to know as a real estate agent. Where are they? You ready? Location, location, location. Oh. <laughs> okay, that was three. You, 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 want, you want to know Justin's? You want to know my, mine? Here we go. Here are mine. Documentation, documentation, Bilateral. documentation. Okay? Do you see the key here? Okay? Because I've worked in a law firm before, and I understand the importance of documentation. Okay, you always document your stuff. You always keep yourself. You always CYA. You don't know what CYA is? Go talk to your friend. Talk to your asset. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. Very good. You do not, do not, guys and gals, ever just go over here and take, especially in this industry. A person by their work. It's sad to say, yeah. but in this industry or in any sales yeah. industry, don't take them by their work. Okay, you and have to get it to right. Don't ever feel awkward about doing it because everybody knows so, that it has to be in writing. So if they call and say it's good, and you say, "Well, can you send me a text?" It's not like they're going to be like, "What?" They're going to be like, "Oh, fair enough." Like yeah. most people understand that that's how it has to be. All right, I'll send it to you. Yeah, they, they all know, okay. so they'll do. Yeah. yeah. And that's one thing that I always, and that's another thing Travis will tell you that my mom drives me crazy with, is you're going to text a lot in this business. You're going to text and text and text and text and text. But when it gets to the file getting ready to close, she'll ask all the agents, have you uploaded all your correspondence? And that includes 
text messages. Because of the fact of the matter is, is that if you've ever been in a lawsuit or dealt with lawsuits, you end up, you have to have your stuff, your ducks in a row. So one of the key things that I always try to tell them is, if you don't want to, if you don't want to send them as they go, that's fine, but screenshot them. Make screenshots of that stuff and just forward them over to us. We'll attach it to the file and we'll cover it. Because you have to end up, if something ever happens, you and I know how it always works. If, you, if a lawsuit happens, then all of a sudden your phone's going to die because something's going to happen to it in the phone and everything's gone and you lost it all. And now you have no documentation to prove anything. And now you're screwed. Okay. So it comes into that situation that you have to cover yourself. And that's why that's one of my biggest pet peeves. I get my agents from all over calling and chewing at me. And I'm like, if you don't like it, there's another firm. Because any other firm is going to make you do the same dead blasted thing that I'm doing. Okay. So or they're going down when they get sued. Or they're going to go down when they go <laughs> get sued. Exactly. So it comes into that situation is, is you have to basically make certain that you're covering yourself. Okay. Very key in these. Now looky here, Travis. We got some more words for them for the buyers and sellers. A lot of people have fifty days. Yeah. Sheldon actually, y'all don't know, Sheldon called me last night and said she wanted more terms for buyer and seller. So I, we just made, made these up last night for her. So we're going to test somehow. Yeah, we just, we just <laughs> randomly, just for you, Sheldon, we, we wanted to do that for you. So. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so in regards to this, the parties, of course, are going to be the seller and the buyer. Okay. Now, the seller is going to be the vendor, okay? And they hold the legal title. The buyer is the vendee who holds the equitable title, which means they're an equitable owner. However, this is where it gets fun. You see right here the OR and the EE on this one? Well, now let me ask you. Miss, I'm gonna kick on Miss Sheldon one time. Miss Sheldon. If this is the vendor, wait, 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 one time. Yeah, just one time, just one time. Okay. Just yeah. one time. Okay. So we have our seller is the vendor and our buyer is the vendee. Who's the offer war? Who's the what? Offer war. The vendee. The vendee. The vendee, very good. Because who's doing the act of offering? The buyer, the buyer which is the vendee. Okay, so then who would be the offeree, Giovanni? Person buying. Ah, no. Remember the EE is the one receiving the offer. Who's receiving the offer to buy? The uh, seller. There you go. Okay. The offeror is going to be the person that's submitting the offer. The offeree is the person that is receiving said offer. Okay. Now, you want to go to the next one? You want to handle it? Nah, you got it. <laughs> Miss Davenport. Oh, you can do it. I, I believe <laughs> you. Who's the counter offeror? That's that's what I was looking for. That, oh, that was also what I was looking that's for. the one that I was okay. that's the one I was looking for actually. If you send an offer, the seller will counter it, which will make them the counter there you go. and the buyer the counter offeree. Oh, but then if you counter that counter, the yep. buyer will then become the counter offer war again. <laughs> and it just goes back and forth. So real quick for everybody online, so that me so I can explain this, okay? Because as you just saw, it, it tripped me. So okay. <laughs> The offer war always starts out as the buyer, always, okay? The offeree receiving the offer is the 
seller. Now, after that seller's received, so let's play this out with the paper here. So you're a seller, I'm buyer. Okay, I'm offeror. I'm handing it to you. You're what? The offeree. Okay, you don't like my offer. What do you do? Hate it. Hate it. Now, now, who are you? The counter offeror. And what am I? Counter offeree. I'm the counter offeree. I don't like his change. Oh, see, I'm already throwing oh, across the field here. He hates it. I hate it. Scratch through it. And now, as the counter offeror, I'm handing it back to the counter offeree. Counter offeree. And he finally accepts. You all see how this works? Test. That's on the test. <laughs> Does that make sense? Online, thumbs up if you understand that. There's no uh, limit to right. how many times you can counter. That is correct. That is correct. It can go back and forth, back and forth. So what's a it's question going to look like? Illinois. Exactly. <laughs> so what's a question like this going to look on the test? Well, they're going to have one that's going to go back and forth. Okay. Yeah. They're going to have one that's going to end up jumping back and forth. Travis sends an offer to Justin. Justin yep. counters it, and Travis counters it. Doesn't like it, and sends back an, another counter based on what he likes. What is Travis? I've got to push my contact. Keep going. Oh, you're going to keep going. So counter offer and counter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no. The, the easiest way to think about it is if it ends in OR, they're the one doing the action, as he said, and if it ends in EE, they're the one receiving whatever it is the other person is doing. Because receive has to be. Yes, that's what I always think about too. Yeah. yeah. And I think of do as it has an O in it. That's what I don't do. That helps me. Yeah. But so, you know, a vendor is the one selling, like a, a vending machine will sell you something. So a vendor is the one doing the selling, whereas the vendee is the one receiving the sale, the sold item. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. My contact dried up. I've got something in my All right. So, in that situation, y'all kind of see how it goes, but they will. They'll go back and forth, back and forth. But you need to just be able to, if you get in a situation like that, they normally will give you a sheet of paper, or not a sheet, it's normally like a little, like, white, like a laminated sheet that you can wipe off of. But kind of break it down on who's who and back and forth. Okay. Now, what are the essential elements of the documents? Well, of course, both parties have to sign. That's where it comes back to earlier, where I said, well, Miss Vita, I just give you a contract, I signed it. It should be a, co a contract. No, because you've not signed. I've signed, but not you. Okay. We also need the property description. Okay. Now, Travis, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I just put Miss Vita's mailing address on the contract, that suffices. One, two, three, Main Street. Uh, yeah, 123 Main Street. That that suffices as property description, right? Oh, count. You gotta put the block in block number and stuff. But why? Why can't I just put one two three Main Street? Well, if you want a mailbox, you can do that. That's exactly right. <laughs> because the 123 Main Street tells me what? Well, this is where the mail is. This is where you deliver your mail. That's the mail address. That's not a problem. Not a so, exactly. It yeah. tells you where the place is, but it doesn't tell you what's, what all you're getting. Okay. So, in this particular situation, you must have property description, and these are your three uh, types your meets and bounds, rectangular survey system, and lot and block. We will discuss those in detail. Now, why is this important, Travis? Well, the rights right. and terms, what are we getting up for? Well, you got to know what, how much you're buying it for. You mean we can't, for. wait a minute, you're telling me that we can't just do it like these fancy restaurants and you just go I in? Yeah, you, you just go in and I say, you know, I just like Vita's property, I'm just going to move in today. I'll just pay her whenever I feel like it. Can, can I do that? Why not? A lot of money. Too many things. <laughs> Too many so issues, right? Yeah. Okay. How many of you have ever been to one of those fancy restaurants? You get the menu and there's no price. Any of you ever been there? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay. Imagine if that's how our contracts work. If it was like, I'm going to buy your property, Miss Vita, but I, I, I don't know. We're just going to leave that blank. We'll yeah, you want to sign that? You want to sign that blank check? Mm -hmm. Then no. Okay. Not at all. So in those situations, you want to make certain that you understand how these all break down. Okay. Now, Travis, question for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just think about contingency clause. What was that? Contingency clause. Well, that's a lot of times it yeah. is set up for the buyer will buy the property okay. as long as whatever, if they're trying to sell a property, as long as that place sells. That usually happens a lot because if. Wait a minute. You, so you're telling me that if I have a house. Uh, 
and I'm going to buy Miss Davenport's house. Why can't I just go and live in her house and she just go somewhere else? You probably I... don't have that much money. You probably need to buy her house with the funds from Miss Davenport, you mean I got to pay you to move in your house? Man, you can buy the one of me now. <laughs> <laughs> See, the key thing here is, is a contingency, is it something contingent on something, okay? So it could be, like it says right here, the example, the buyer is unable to, to obtain finance. Yeah. yeah, how would you like to be forced to buy a house? That's another one of my stickers with y'all all the time, is I actually had this happen with a client. That's why I'm a very big stickler on the third party finance. In there, it talks about that the buyer must keep approval and all this to close and there's a date, okay? Well, the standard around here is 21 days. But after the 21 days, if they lose financing, they still could possibly be forced to buy the property even though they lost financing. So my attorney always advised me to do this. If I'm doing a 30-day closing, then what number should I put in that blank? 30. 30 days because a job can happen to be lost when the last night okay so he always said that now here's the thing if i'm sending you a contract with 30 days so my client can bag up bag out of the contract all the way up to the closing do you like that heck no <laughs> even if you're a seller you don't want that so a lot of times they'll come back and they'll say seven or ten days we'll give your client this much but see, I actually had a client, they were going to buy a house. Her husband lost his job. She then lost her job. And it was right after the 21 day period. And the other agent went and spoke with counsel and they started talking and almost a lawsuit to force them to buy the house when they could even get financing. So very key that you understand these contingencies, okay? Now, this, this term here, time is of the essence, this is not important, correct, Travis? It's not important at all, right? You'll see that in almost everything you look at, every document, every contract. This means, looks like we have that term in so, so this means that if I give you a contract, I can go sit over here and twiddle my thumbs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can just do that, and then I'll just, I'll just go on vacation, and I'll get back to you. And we just close this whenever we want. Yeah, give it a the know, dates in the contract. A nothing, year or right? two, and I'll figure it out. Right, that's, that's how this works, right? <laughs> y'all, I mean, when y'all want to buy a house or something, y'all just y'all don't mind if you buy two years down the road, right? No, no. Really, the value of it goes down. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> right. The whole thing is, is that it often includes a time of the essence clause talking about the contingency which requires exact adherence to the date specified or it is in breach. It's in breach. So if me and Travis, if I submitted Travis this contract, and I wrote this up and I submitted a contract and said, I need seven days to do inspections. That means I have 14, right Travis? I don't know. No. How many do I have? You have seven, I believe. I thought you would have 17. You have no. 10. No, it was 37. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah you're not buying this house. I'm not buying this house, right? <laughs> because the thing is, is that I put in there seven days. But don't you have those 10 days? That, that's the, he so would have put 10 days. That's how many days you put in the contract. If he put seven, so he had seven. But you're thinking it's the same thing. It could be seven or 10. It's 90% of the time. You're talking about the option period? Yeah. That's, that's what you're talking about. That's what so yeah, I normally have 10 days for $100, yeah. but it sometimes can be seven. Yeah. And I, 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 think, I even had it as low as five. I'm actually under contract right now where we put in a contract for 10 days at $100, and they countered and said, how about seven for 250 Yeah. And so we only have seven days to do our inspections. Here in town, Brian Welch Station, or our surrounding area, seven days, 100 bucks, or 10, seven to 10 days, 100 bucks. That's 100 bucks, yeah. You go to Houston? They want approximately minimum two fifty minimum yeah. for about five. Okay. How do you get inspected that lineup? You uh, work magic. <laughs> They're hard to get. Yeah. Yes. Try a surveyor. 
Yeah, yeah they're really hard to get. Yeah, I don't want to talk about tripping. <laughs> yeah, he knows. That is one thing that I have very good relationships, and that's something that's very key in this business. Yeah. You better have good relationships. Yeah. yeah. If you it's, don't have good relationships, you're not going to make people. It's nice. Like, with my brother, when we bought his house, we had, I think it was something like seven days or whatever, and he's down in Houston. I don't know him in Houston, but I know Justin and a couple of inspectors so i called them i called a couple of them and they were like yeah we'll go to like and one guy went out like i think i caught him on a wednesday and he went out friday and he was like yeah go on, do it. like no problem and so i have inspectors that i could call right now and be like hey can you meet me in an hour over here and he'll be like yeah, sure yeah. Dude, i'm gonna charge you but come on yeah so, so it's nice have knowing having connections yeah one thing that i will tell you that i always do is i don't deal with the whole you scratch my back i scratch your back mm -hmm. what i deal with like i had one we scheduled an inspection. The inspector came out, started the inspection. My client was not happy. I knew it clear as day he was not happy. I stopped the inspection and I said, do you want this house? And he said, no, I do not. I said, then we're not gonna even waste this man's time. We're gonna keep yeah, on pushing, we're, we're just done, we're yeah. finished. And I said, so we're gonna go in and just get this whole thing done. And uh, would you mind this question? And so we went over and everything, and I said, you know, I'm not going to waste your time. I ain't going to waste the inspectors. Let's all just be done. And so um, I went over and everything, and I stopped it. So the inspector was like, well, don't, don't worry about it. I, I'm not going to charge you. And I said, no, you are going to charge me because I don't want to have to owe you. That's the key thing. And I paid. And, and I, it's just the best and easiest way is I just pay it, get it done, there is no I owe you stuff because that just doesn't work out. It just gives it time out of the day to meet you there. That's right. It's still paid for gas. Yep. That's right. And he did the job, did part of the service. Yeah. So, and he's like, well, I'll charge you, you know, half the rate. I said, whatever you want, but I'm paying you. Because I've been there in this field and he's been there. And I promise you, you will be there too. All of you will be there where you're going to be in a situation that you go in and you, poor Travis has drove caught. For just one client, he did, he did, what was it? Where's that one? I mean, you went way out here, way here, way here, like in many <laughs> different cities. Not even went North Bryan, Caldwell, Brenham, Waller, Nav Plannersville, Navasota. Yeah. For one out. client. In one day. Yeah. It was like a, it was like eight hours of showing. And then they didn't even buy. And they and that, well, after all that, they said that they like the one in Bryan the most. And then when I called about the one of Brian, they were like, yeah, I think we're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we get paid. Yeah, that you don't get paid for none of that none unless of you go. Unless you get unless a sale. Unless there is a sale. Yeah, right. Right. Not even under contract. Unless you That's why a buyer's rep is very <laughs> Because let me tell you, Ms. Vita, this also happens. I was going to say, yeah. He goes, shows those same. Say that was Ms. Davenport. He shows this Davenport all these deals. Okay. And then he decides that he needs to go out. For vacation. Well, okay. Right. This actually happened in that same stretch. Yeah, this, in the same stretch, I was told on like the fifth of the seven properties or whatever. We were just kind of. It was her and her friend, and um, it's this lady and her husband there buying it, and her friend was just there because they just bought a house recently, so she kind of knows you know, how the process works or whatever. And I was told like the fifth one that her friend's husband is a realtor. Yeah, that and so I got I got them to sign a buyer's rep, but if I hadn't, there's a very good possibility we would have gone to see all seven, and then, and then they would have been like, I like the one on Brian. Yeah. Don't worry, I'll have my husband write the form. We'll we'll go through them. Yeah. That happens a lot, though. Yeah, that happens a lot. So can we start off the conversation by like, do you know what you don't do this? Or... I always. Yeah. I always. <laughs> yeah. I I I always. Now I will tell you, there are some just crooked people out there, or mean people. I've had one that I talked to, and I said, do you, exactly. Yeah. I said, do you have a real, do you, are you working with a realtor? Because I have a duty. If you're working with a realtor, I'm not supposed to be talking to you. That's your realtor. That's who you were dealing with. I cannot influence that at all. I have a code of ethics i got to follow. And I ended up, I asked, I said, no, no, we're not using anybody. And I went out and showed probably about seven or eight houses on a Saturday when I actually had hurt my foot, so I was on crutches. So I was driving out there, using the crutch to drive, got to these places, showed them all. Once we were done, I said, all right, well, which one do you want to put a contract in? And they said, oh, no, we're, we've got a realtor that we're working with. They're going to draft you. They just didn't want to come down. Their agent was in Austin, 
I was here showing all of them. Their agent didn't have access to our MLS, so they had me show them all, and then they decided on one so that she could go and put the offer in. Yeah. And, and there's a super easy way around that, which is just get a buyer's representation and sign that form. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. she would like it's right her. But so all you have to do is the buyer's representation form basically says, I think ours says any counties in Texas. Um, but I know for like if you are in Bryan College Station, that's all you can work. A lot of times it will say like anything in the Bryan MLS system, where that's Bryan College Station, Grimes County, Carlson County, all that, all those places, you will not use any other realtor except for me. And you basically put them under contract that they agree to that. And then if they go and do that, if that happens and then they find another realtor and go use them, you're still entitled to your commission. Based on that contract, I still get my three percent. Even if they do that. Even if they have somebody else do it. So good luck. I, you're still paying me. Yeah. And then what it also has in it that's kind of nice is that um, you can put terms in there that if, like, if I represent you for a whole year or six mm -hmm. months and you don't buy anything, but I go show you one of the houses, you have to pay me for gas and this and that, like for for the expenses that I do. Because and I and I hate I feel I always feel weird putting that in there because I think it used to say we used to have something in there like it was like up to a thousand dollars and I was like that's kind of harsh because I feel like I'll go show one person something Brian and that's it and then I'm like you're not gonna pay me a thousand but like don't worry about that like I won't even charge you anything like it was five minutes out of my way no big deal this is just a miss of that yeah. but that lady that drove me all around you want those if things. she's not buying anything you're paying me for my gas that I spent. you're paying wow. me for my expenses of my my nine hours a day. I mean, I've done that twice before where I've driven to all here and everywhere. And she's super interested in stuff, but they just like, they don't want to, they don't, they don't know what they're doing. They don't want to like push a, they don't want to jump in yet. I'm like, you, you need to figure this out. Because <laughs> all the places they're looking at, they're all sold now. Because yeah. the market's doing fast. So like, even if you like that place, it's gone. Too bad. So we need to find something you like and then jump in on it. Because <laughs> that's all you've got. And that, I mean, uh, and that's part of it in this business is mm -hmm. you have to, when you come into this business and you get your license, you know, Sheldon may be like, I want to go show houses. I like to look at houses because a lot of people I talk yeah. to, they're like, I like houses. I want to go look at all these different houses and see them. That's fine. If you want to go look and use a realtor tour day and go look around houses, that's perfectly yeah. fine. But don't get it where Sheldon goes and takes, say, Travis here and says, you know what? You're a client that I've never met. I'm going to go show houses for you and then goes around and shows because now what Travis is going to think is that, well, I can just pull Sheldon wherever I want 24 seven and just, she can go look, show me houses all day. You have to, in that situation, you got to draw that line. That's why I made that clear because that, the lady, she's buying a fairly, I mean, a pretty expensive house. It's almost a million dollars is what their budget is. So that's kind of, I'm willing to drop everything and go show them the house <laughs> if they want it because that's a nice paycheck. Yeah. But then after that first day of doing that, I remember on a Tuesday, it was probably 8 30 or 9 p.m i was kind of like i got home from just kind of chilling out for the rest of the night before i went to bed and i got a message from her that was like hey there's this place in lane oh, yeah. like can we go look at it at 10 a.m tomorrow and i'm like it might no it's, it's in boca it's in boca so you also found the night <laughs> no oh, right. not, not, not my agent no, right. she said 10 no. it was 10 a.m the next morning she wanted to go show oh, okay. 10 a.m the next morning in boca which is like 45 minutes northwest of atlanta and I'm like, I'm not driving five hours to show you a house on 11 hour notice. Like, I, I'm not giving it. And she's like, oh, okay, nice. we'll look at it another time. And I was like, I mean, if you want to, I'll figure it. My grandparents live in Lano, so I was thinking, like, I could go and hang out with them. Like, it'd actually be a good trip for me if I did it. So, yes, I will show it to you. Give me, like, a week. Let me, <laughs> let me figure out what I'm doing first. But, like, you can't just call me on two hour notice wanting me to drive five hours. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. It's very key when you're going through these. And like I said, Travis, the reason I like Travis teaching that class is because he's gonna go so detailed in it. Yeah. Because he's been in those situations. Yeah. You know, and he understands it. And so, like I said, is all of these are very key. When we're talking about contingency, time is of the essence. These are key things that you have to move promptly. Does this work, Travis? Well, I'm sorry, but I was busy. I have so much business. I'm too busy to, to, to meet the deadline. Does that does that count? No, no, but I'm busy. A lot of realtors. Are you busy with your job? This is your job. Well, this is my job, and I and my clients. But I, I got like seven clients. I'm working at one time. You should tone that back. Exactly. Exactly. 
We've learned in my office that about five yeah. is a fair amount that you can manage and actually not drop the ball. But if you go over five, I had like 14 at one time when I started, so I would just pick out everybody else. That's horrible. Okay. Now, like the amount of times that my phone would like, because we have a system that we use that gives us an each or whatever, and it'd be like, you should update this lead. You, you know, it shows here that you haven't talked to them in two weeks. And I'm like, who is Emily? I was like, what? Well, I want to know who that person is. I want to know what they're looking for. I have no idea about this person. Yeah. But I've talked to her three times on the phone. But I've talked to four. I have no idea who these people are. Yeah. So it's like, that's what I was like, all right, just send them to other people. Like, I need five or six, and that's it. Like, I can't do anything. And that's the key thing. I mean, you really think about it. If you say, be it, you know, like I said, Giovanni's a millionaire. So if you get Giovanni to buy a million dollar house, that's $30,000 in commission out there. And some people, $30,000, that's their entire year salary. So you think about it, you go get just even just four 250,000 houses. There's a million dollars. So do you have etiquette classes so I can learn to be proper? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, these super posh for these millionaires. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you the million dollar houses that I have, that even the millionaires I've worked with, they're the most late so chat. <laughs> I I literally showed an eight hundred thousand dollar house in this outfit. Yeah. Like the red polo, some blue <laughs> basketball shorts. This like, is his this is Travis. Like yeah. when you see this is just this is his image. This yeah. is him. And the first time I go show people, I'll dress up, I mean I'll be in slacks, button down, tucked in shirt, whatever. Yeah. But if I if I've shown you two houses and they're cool, I can tell that you're showing up and cargo shorts and a tank top and I'm like sweet I'm doing that too I'm like, yeah. this is like I'm <laughs> sweet I will be honest you're cool with it I'm doing it like, I I dress like this because y'all know how it is here in Texas I'll dress like this but when it starts getting 100 degrees outside <laughs> do not be surprised if I'm not in here with shorts and a polo right because yeah. that's just that's how I am I mean that's I, I actually my very first multi-million dollar house that I dealt with I went down to Austin I was in a suit and tie. Oh, yeah. I had cufflinks on. Like I was, I was ready. I walked in here, and I go and I knock on the client's door because it ended up as a friend of a friend that kind of got us together. Knock on the door, and the guy comes in and kind of looks like Travis. He, he's like, hey man, how's it going? And I was like, oh, I completely overdressed for this. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then the realtor that showed up ended up the other one that was had a buyer he showed up and he was in just shorts a torn shirt because he just went and worked out his shirt kind of had tears in it and he was like oh i didn't know we were dressing up for a formal event i would have dressed nicer you know but no everybody's in shorts and here i am all dressed to the nines and i'm like okie dokie then so exactly exactly that's exactly <laughs> I mean, it was so funny, y'all. But I mean, that's what it is in this business. I mean, people are people. Oh yeah, you. I will be honest with you. I had uh, my very, 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 very first broker. He was very strict on dress, dress code. Very strict. You were to be in. Uh, you could not go in being slacks, long sleeve shirt, and a tie. Okay. And when you went showing, all showing, everything had to be like that. I hated it because it reminded me back of a law firm that I worked at. Because at the law firm, we always had to be dressed like that because you never knew when you're going to run into a judge. So you always had to be looking nice. And um, and I was like, I don't like this. And then I went to my second broker, and my second broker was just chill, just kind of like how Travis is, laid back, chill, just normal guy. And I was like, you can do this. Like you can actually dress nice. And uh, or down and all. I was like, so I I went in. I started wearing shorts and a, and a, a shirt, polo, and, and I was like, I like this. Like you know, people just because you're going to be especially if you're walking and it's land, you do not want to be dressed like this walking land. I went with one of our own agents. They wanted to see 50 acres, and they wanted to walk it. It was. Well, like, you should have brought a trailer. Oh, yeah, there was a lady actually. With the ATV? Yeah, there was a lady actually that we went and looked at four properties and they were all over 45 acres. Yep. And I was dressed like that because it's my first time meeting them. And after like the second property, I was like, not anymore. If we're coming out again, I'm just going to let you know, I'm 
shorts and t-shirt and they want to pass them. I'm like, awesome. I just want to get that clarified now. <laughs> <laughs> so if we call it anymore, I can. And there's something <laughs> about being dressed comfortable that's more genuine and yes, more, exactly. you want to be more, and more personal. It's more professional yeah, right. being dressed up and everything, yeah. but at the same time, yeah. yeah. You know, if I'm going to a closing table, I'm going to go dress like this. Okay, unless my client yeah. is Please. cool with me not doing it, but 90% of the time I'm going like this. But if I'm going to show them properties, especially if I'm going to be going out in the woods, right. I'm going in shorts and a t-shirt, going in tennis shoes, because I am not walking that in these shoes. I have done it before. Horrible mistake. Horrible mistake. It's like a woman dra dressing and having high heels walking in 48 hours. Yeah. Ain't going to happen. Okay, you're going to break your, your ankle. Yeah. So, and I have a lady that does that. She used to be one of my agents. She used to be Miss Texas. She won Miss Texas years ago. And so she goes, and she's always a beautiful lady. She always wears her her uh, her high heels and all this. And she'll go show. Well, one day a client went to show uh, see a property. They went and saw the house. And while they were there, they want to see some land. And so she was all dressed to go in the house, but not for that. So she called me, and she was like. I got some flats in the back of my car, but I don't have like tennis shoes and they were off these 40 acres. And I don't know what, I was like, you just throw on your flats and you just gonna walk girl. So she ended up got halfway out to the property and she always keeps her like her keys in her hands. And so she had them and she dropped them and started looking at the grass was already tall and tried to find, couldn't find her keys, had to call her husband. Husband had to come out with one of those metal detector things and find her keys so she can get in her car. So, oh yeah, that's the stuff that you deal with. But enough of my stories. <laughs> There's been a lot of stuff. Oh no, no, no. So you also have to have financing information. Uh, again, this is to, are gonna be addressed by the contract, of course, for the purchase price, uh, how the purchaser is gonna to intend to pay for the property and conditions of the financing. Uh, there is also going to be earnest money, earnest money deposits, or EMDs, and that's going to be the evidence of the buyer's intent to carry out the terms of the contract. So it's an amount that's agreed upon by the parties, and it's a concern for brokers because the fact is, is there could be commingling. Now, what exactly do you think, Ms. Davenport, commingling is? What's that? What's the, what does commingle mean? What, is, what does that sound like? Mm -hmm. So you have a hundred dollars. That's your hundred dollars, Miss Davenport. Mm -hmm. And I give you a hundred dollars. And I say, hold my hundred dollars for me, Miss Davenport. So you got two hundred dollars. You might just want to do what? Well, I'm just going to put them both in my purse and storage. What did you just do? You commingle. You put somebody else's money in your purse that you weren't supposed to, okay? So in that situation, commingling is where you're gonna go in and you're going to put money that is not yours or has not been earned and put it into your personal account or into your operating account. It has to be separated. And that's why, me personally, I never allow, nor any of my agents are allowed to get cash from any clients. That that needs to be made out to the title company, that needs to be made out to the seller, whatever, and never needs to be given to Justin or Travis or any other person. Okay? Because this is the quickest way to lose your license. Go me. Okay? Oh yes. Again, the information needed on the one to four family residential contract in paragraph three when dealing with financing, there's going to be your cash down payment the amount of the first loan, the amount of the second loan, and the sales price. Now let me explain something on this particular situation, okay? The cash down payment is gonna be the amount. So say for example, Ms. Sheldon, say that I wanna buy your house from you, and you wanna sell it for $200,000. Now I may put down $100,000 in cash, so the first box in paragraph three, the cash down payment, I put $100,000. But Sheldon still wants $200,000 for her house, okay? So Ms. Sheldon says, you know, hey, I want my other $100,000. Pull it up real quick, actually. Pull it up real quick. 
He's going to pull it up just so y'all can see it. Can you go to three there? Thank you, sir. There it is. All right, see down here at the bottom where it says three? He's actually clearing it out here. Scroll it up just a little bit. Oh, yeah. mind, so everybody, all right, don't even, not up down like that. Oh, my bad. Go down a little more, a little more right there. All right. So, Mr. Davenport, you see this right here, paragraph three? Okay. So, in this situation is, like we just said, you're going to have A, 3A talks about the cash portion of the sales price payable by the buyer at closing. Okay. B talks about the sum of all financing described in the attached, either the third party financing addendum, the loan assumption addendum, or seller financing. And then C is your sales price. Okay. So in this particular situation, Miss uh, Sheldon, Actually, let's, let's see here, Ms. Sheldon. I'm going to give you the hypothetical, and Sheldon, I'm going to ask you to give me the answers, and, and Travis will fill it in. Oh, All right, ready? <laughs> yeah. Here we go. So, Sheldon, here's the hypothetical. Justin wants to purchase your house for $200,000. Justin has $100,000 in cash that he wants to put down. The remainder, he's going to have to get financing. He went to Miss Davenport and Miss Davenport gave him $20,000. He then went to Corey and got another $20,000. He then went to Giovanni and got the remainder. How exactly do you fill in this contract, Miss Sheldon? Um, I think 3A would be $100,000. Okay. Then B would be the third party financing, and it would be another hundred thousand dollars, and then C would be the two hundred thousand dollars. But why, right? why, don't, why don't we need to break down about Miss Davenport, Miss Corey, and uh, Giovanni? Why don't we, don't we need to break those down? Well, it doesn't really give us the space to break those down, and it's not asking, just asking what the sum of all the financing is so all the sum of all of the ones that you just stated are a hundred thousand dollars and it's from a third party there you go the key word there is it doesn't matter if i have 15 different people giving me the money or a hundred thousand giving me one dollar okay it's saying in b that it wants the sum of all financing so it does not matter if there's multiple people giving money to finance it it ultimately, they just want to have the whole sum. So the easiest way to fill this out is this, is if you know what 3A is, and you know what 3C is, then what do you do, Travis? You subtract A from C. You subtract A from C and bam, there you go. Okay, because you can't put in here, because if you look right here on 3C, it says sum of A and B, okay? So if A is 100,000 and B is 20,000, does 100,000 plus 20,000 equal 200,000? No, not done. 100 plus 20, 100 plus 20 gives you 120. You see here? So you have to make certain that all of this adds up. So for example, Ms. Davenport right here, if we know that, that, that you want to submit a contract and offer for 200,000, Okay, and we know up here that you're putting 20,000 down. Okay, so you're putting an offer in at 20, you're putting, or 200,000, and you're putting down 20. What goes here in the middle blank? Subtract 200 from 20, and what do you get? 180. You're good, you're good. But do you kind of see how that works? So when you're dealing with these situations, you want to break them down where it's going from 200 minus this or this, or vice versa, you can add them up. But ultimately, it it's got to equal. Does that make sense? Everybody online, does that make sense? Because I know that can get confusing. Good, good. All right, perfect, perfect. All right, let's go back to the slides. All right. All right. So paragraph four, deals with the types of financing, okay? The addenda that is needed, as well as the term of the first loan, 
the term of the second loan, the interest rate of the first loan, the interest rate of the second, and the assumption of the loan balance. Now let me explain something on this. Paragraph four is also going to be discussed in the third party financing addendum, which Mr. Stahl will go through word for word with y'all, verbatim. Okay? So we will be going through those. So don't stress too much on that. Now, how do we convey property? Just don't want to make sure I'm saying that. Oh, it's one more. One more. Yeah. Okay. Um, in regards to the conveyance of the property. Now, you have to know the type of deed, okay? And if you recall from the previous classes, we talked about general warranty, special, and bargain and sale, as well as quick claim. So you got to know the type of deed, the date and place of closing. Why is this important, Travis? So you know where you need to go and what they need to do in there to close. You mean that you mean I actually have to go somewhere to close? Close the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little different now. But. And Miss Vita <laughs> can tell you, do you always have to go to Tyler to close? Yeah, I would think so. Ooh. Can you do it electronically? You could be a mobile notary. Oh. Yeah. And I teach a course on that. Mobile notary? Yes. A mo if you are a notary, if you're a notary public, mm -hmm. you can go if, say for example, Miss Davenport, that you were working at your job. You're, yeah, you're I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, that's right. But say for example that you work at your job mm -hmm. and you ended up, you don't get off till five o'clock. Okay. But you're closing on your house. Well, if you work eight to five, title companies only open eight to five. So what happens is, is they would send Miss Vita to your house at say six or seven o'clock. She would do the entire closing with you, sign it, and then she would send it back to the lender, process it, and it's done. That's still to the title company. Title would get it sometimes. The reason they always say lender, they send it most of the time. The lender wants to get the certain documents. So a lot of times I want you, either the title company wants you to send it to them or title will ask you to send it to the lender for approval or something or whatever. Some of them will want you to fax the stuff to title, ship it to the lender. And nobody knows how to do that. Either. Yeah. You'll get a lot, it's called <laughs> fax back. And a fax back is they want you to just fax it to them and send the rest of the documents to the lender. As the lender is asking for the ink on the paper. So, but again, and, and I mean, right, you yes. can't notarize your own if Justin's doing a sale, yeah, I can't do he can't notarize his own clients selling a property. And, it's, and I also, not just myself, yeah. but I also cannot do my entire company. I'm about to so yeah, so I, if I became a notary, I can, can I can't notarize Stephanie's sale. Right. right. Because it's, what's the most are you being compensated? <laughs> well, it's actually a lot of people think that it's, you know, well, why would I want to do it? Money wise, it's oh, actually yeah. not bad. Yeah. I I had one, they couldn't get a mobile notary to do it. They paid me five hundred dollars to drive from here to Willis, do a closing, and come back. So I was like, five hundred bucks, that's a steal. And then I shipped the stuff, did the closing, shipped it all back. They called me the next day and said, uh, Mr. Nobles, uh, would you mind doing the closing again? And I said, Why? We put the wrong date. Ooh. So we need you to go back out and we'll pay you again another 500 bucks. So in two you days, the wrong date again. I made a thousand dollars in two days. So, but that only happens once in a blue moon. Yeah. Very, very rare. Well, again, and with that too, like I had, I had some clients who were uh, selling their house and they were really good friends of my parents. And so my dad passed away. We all went to Galveston to kind of be with my mom. And uh, they were there the entire time we were there for two weeks or whatever. But the closing kept getting pushed back and it ended up being on one of the days we were all down there. And so I told them, I was like, we're not driving back up to, I think it was Hempstead. I was like, we're not driving back up to Hempstead to do this closing. Like, we're just going to do it. Like, what can we do? And my mom, one of her best friends is a notary who was actually approved by the title company. And so we just had them email me the documents and I, we just print them all out and then just Right there, we were all at the house, so we just had the notary sign as they signed, and then just FedEx it back to the title company. Yep. Yeah, so it's, it's, it is, it's some things that you can do, and that's one thing in this business. That's why everybody always asks me, why do I have so many degrees, and why do I have so many licenses? Well, the reason, to be honest with you, 
is because of the fact is, guys and gals, is that you, you're going to have ups and downs, just like with any business. You're going to be down, you're going to be up. You're going to make money, you're going to lose money. That's how it goes. Okay? So in this business, you always want to be able to make money when it's dead. I had a very good friend of mine that I worked, her husband, uh, well, me and her worked at Blend together, and her husband was working at U-Haul. And I was very busy. I wasn't a broker at the time. I was just an agent. And uh, he's making like eight, nine dollars an hour. And but he doesn't like dealing with people long term. Like he doesn't mind spending an hour, two hours with you, but he wants to be done with you. Like he has a very short, just hi bye kind of thing. That's how he likes to deal with people. And so I always say, well, you need to get your real estate license. And he's like, no, I can't deal with somebody for thirty days. Like I just can't deal with them for thirty days. So I said, well, you should do mobile notaries. He ended up within his, he did no, mobile notaries for two weeks. He quit his job and now he does it full time and he's bringing in close to about $70,000 a year just doing mobile notaries. I can do that so, right now. Why so that's, <laughs> that's something on the side. So when, that, when, when, when can you do the, uh, yeah, what, what are those classes? I actually, <laughs> I actually am, I had, no, actually, it's a two-day course. It is a two-day course, and uh, so so tomorrow's the prep course, but not next week and possibly the following. I, I've had enough people that have asked about doing another one, so I may do another one in two weeks to just kind of get another batch in. But in two days, you'll be finished. You'll be certified. You'll be able to get out there. You'll just if you don't have your notary license, go on and get it. Okay because that's the longest part is getting the license and you can get the license without having to do the course so you go in and get the notary license all you gotta do is pay the 80 or 90 bucks to get it once you get it then i train you on what to do and how to market yourself and all that kind of stuff and they give you the stuff and we'll do like a test run here in the office and then you'll be good to go you won't need me so yes so that's something you can do but uh, but it's, it's it's a side hustle, and like with Travis, you know, he could end up he could be showing you know a lot of properties, but then in his path, he could pull off maybe a Waller and do a, yeah. a closing, and okay, I'm gonna go do another showing, you know. So you you're always gonna be on the run. I always tell people this: if you think real estate is you sit behind the desk and play behind the computer all day, you've got another thing coming. Okay, <laughs> it's you're you're on the road 90% of the time, and that's a good thing. Yes, on the phone and on the road. So, now why do we need the closing agent? What's so big about that? It's a neutral party. It's a neutral person, and oftentimes this individual also is the escrow agent. So they'll also hold it, or hold the escrow. Of course, we want to know about our title search. We want to make sure that title is actually clear and marketable. <laughs> Did you tell about your brother? No. You want to tell them real quick? Yeah, so my brother, we, again, he bought a house. Tell them what a title search is real quick. And they tell them. Oh, so title basically just does this. They do a search on the property to make sure there's no liens, no mortgages, no taxes, nothing like that that's still on the property. Uh, my brother got his house in September or end of August, and he called me, I guess about two weeks ago, and just freaking out. And I was like, "What? what's happening? He goes, my house has back taxes on it. And I was like, well, it's not possible because title will do a search and find all that stuff and make sure it's all paid off before they do it. How much is it? Like, and he was like, well, I don't know if I like, do I need to pay it? And I was like, you're definitely not going to have to pay it. Like, that's not how that's going to work, but we'll figure it out. How much is it? He's like, it's like $36,000. And I was like, that's like seven years of taxes for that property that apparently weren't paid on it. And apparently title just didn't catch it or something. Like, I don't know how it happened, but so I called title. Because basically all I have to do, I told him, I was like, you're, this is the end of you worrying about it. Because I'm going to call title, and title will basically do their own investigation from there. And if they missed it, they have to pay it. Like, it all comes out of them for their, their that's why we have title insurance, because if they're a problem. Um, and if they can get a hold of the seller, they'll make him pay. Like, if, you, but you're not going to have to pay him. You're not even going to pay 10 bucks for, like, you, you're good. So just, you don't have to worry about it. Leave it up to me. That's. I'll get on the title and the title will figure it out. <laughs> so, but yeah, so you will sometimes run into, I mean, very rarely does yeah. that happen. But what happens is when a title company is swamped and it happens normally during peak season, they have so many that they're going through, you're going to miss stuff. Yeah. You're going to miss stuff. But that's also this what was they have So this is during the peak season in the heights in Houston. So they're dealing with everything. So 
not really a surprise. <laughs> like, it's like if there was a time they were going to miss it, it would have been around that time of the year, you know, everything going on. So, but the key thing I got to tell him when he brought it to mind, I said, just call title. That's title's obligation. Title won't be investigate. Title yeah. won't review it. Title will then make that decision and go from there. So, you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, in regards to default and breach of contract, this basically, there are different situations. There's a provision in the, or not, well, yeah, there is a provision in the contract. There's three different ways on how a contract can end up being breached, okay? The first one is what we call rescission, okay? The, the parties can at some point decide, you know what, this isn't going to happen. Uh, we're going to just rescind the contract. It may be a mutual, you know what? Let's all just voluntarily just walk away and just leave. Okay. Now, when that happens, say for example, me and Travis, we're working a deal, and I end up, I can't get the financing, whatever. If I'm outside of my time, Travis has an option. Okay. Me and him can either say, you know what, man, I can't do it. Okay, no big deal. We'll just move on. Everybody just kind of split and we go on. And I get my earnest money back. Or Travis can say, uh uh. You're outside of your stuff. You didn't obey, obey the contract, the term of the contract. So I want the earnest money. Now, if he accepts the earnest money, he loses his right to sue these two here. Okay. So if your client ever accepts earnest money, they lose their right to sue for damages or sue for specific performance. That's also why if you have a buyer that is a client that backs out of a contract, you always push for them to give the other people take the earnest money because all the time it's a thousand or two thousand dollars let them have it because you don't know say a week down the road they like you know what that sob bubble i'm gonna go sue now or they go tell their friend and whatever and then their friends a realtor or their friends says well you know you can sue them for such and such if they've accepted that earnest money they can't come back for this so they both agree the if they both agree, like say me and Travis say, you know what, man, here you go, and here's the earnest money. I screwed up. Here, you keep the yeah. earnest money. I'm just, I'm out of this. Well, if he accepts earnest money, I don't have to worry about him coming back for this. I just take the loss, move on, and he gets the suit, or he can't sue me for damages or specific. And I've, I've had this happen twice, and like what I do is there's a document that is a release of earnest money form, and so basically you're you put on there like. You know, it's like seller or buyer will receive the earnest money and then both parties sign there. And what I do is what, if I send them an email that says, hey, we're going to back out of the contract, I send them that and that form at the exact same time. And the form is already signed by my party. They just have to sign it because I just want them to sign it and just call it a day. Because, again, if they don't, suddenly you're being sued to buy the house. <laughs> or you're getting sued. And, yeah. That's what he saw. That's the specific performance. Yes. That's the, if you breach contract, they may go to a judge and tell the judge, say that you don't buy my house. Well, I may sue you and go, your honor, Davenport, she didn't buy my house and I want you to force her to buy my house. And if the judge can see that you got the cash, and there may be a specific performance that you got to continue to buy my house. Okay. Or that's a lot more money than thousand dollars. Exactly. <laughs> Just hiring an attorney is more cost <laughs> money. The damages, of course, have to be real damages. Yes. Now, you can't. I can't go, Miss. Miss. Uh, oh my God. You'll get there. That's what happens when my brain just froze. It literally just. There you go. <laughs> I'm getting old. No, don't feel bad because even bad. even my mother will be sitting in there and I'll be like, Woman. No, I know. I mean, I've, I've seen it happen before where he's like, Yeah, mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> oh my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You. I'm terrible. He told me love you on the phone. I have. Because he was looking at he was talking to Linda. Was, and he was like, love you. And I was like, oh, I love you. I was you. sitting at my desk <laughs> on the phone talking to him. My mom's talking to me while he's talking. So I'm having two conversations. And then she's like, she's going somewhere or something. And I said, I love you. And he's like, I love you too, man. I'm like, oh my God. It was really like, all right, talk to you later. Love you. Like, yeah. Love you too, man. I got it. Yeah. Did you tell me that post? <laughs> so. That's what happens when I got 50 million things going yeah, on at one time. Right. 
But for example, though, I can't be like Miss Vita. I ended up I'm emotionally damaged, so I'm going to sue you for a hundred million dollars. I can't. It's got to be justifiable damages. Okay. A lot of people, you know, a contract falls through. You know, if that person, like we had an issue with one contract, and we had to talk to our seller. Our seller was like, well, "I'm going to sue for damages. I'm going to sue for this." And I was like, "Well, what are you damaged? You still have the property." Yeah. yeah, you're out by 30 days. You did not leave, like, it was raw land. It's raw land. You didn't live on it. It's raw land. Yeah. There's nothing on there. You didn't move anything. You didn't. It so there's house. no cost. It was, it was a house, and you had to move out and rent a place yeah. to live. Then you're damaged. Because you had to sell it. Yeah, then it's like, but that makes sense. But you're in raw land. What are you going to sue for? Hmm. What, there, and by the way, it's right next to your house. You didn't do anything else. Like, <laughs> And, you know, of course, you're going to get sellers that are going to flip crap and be like, you know, what the hell, boy? Sometimes you got to pull them back down. Like, do you want to go spend $2,000 to basically end up settling and making maybe $100 or $200? Okay. But that's basically what they're talking about in this situation is regards to they can either rescind the contract, they can sue for damages or sue for specific performance or actually sue for both. They can sue for both of these. Uh, but again, like I always tell clients, you know, I always try whenever I'm dealing with something, if I see the issue ahead of me, like if I see like a VA loan, if I get a VA loan, I'm going to tell if Sheldon, Ms. VD, you give me a contract as a VA, I'm going to tell Ms. Sheldon, my client will say, Ms. Sheldon, this is a veteran's loan. These are the things that happens in a veteran's loan. This is the process. It takes time. You're going to be hit with a lot of things. You're going to need repairs. You're going to be dealing with this and that and all. I give Sheldon everything. Full disclosure. Full disclosure. And I don't ever, ever hide stuff. If I know something or somebody gives me bad news, I sometimes I'll get agents that will come to me and be like, well, I just got this call and this is it. This is bad news. What do I need to do? And my first thing to them is, have you told your client? Have you told whoever your client is? And they'll say, well, no, I haven't told them. That's the person you say, well, I don't want to tell them because they're going to be mad. Of course they are. Of course they are. But think about this. I would rather go tell Travis some bad news immediately than wait seven days. And then we're about to close. And I say, oh, by the way, we're not closing. Because now what's happened is Travis is going to be furious. You deal with it in the beginning. Take the butt chewing, as I say, and just deal with it. It, it is it is sometimes it can be nasty because i've had one client that got furious that they got mad at my agent and then they called me and and gave me a good one and i actually i just Bye. her name was sheldon and i just i just mute i hit the mute button and then i went on and got me some uh, drink and just you know laid back whenever she stopped talking then i was okay so is that right, Sheldon? What's that? How our conversation went? Um, I'm gonna need a transcript because I don't remember it like that. <laughs> but but no, we uh, you do run into some. Actually, Miss Sheldon's transaction was one of the, the better ones. I I would say Miss Sheldon yours actually went pretty well, didn't it? I mean, we didn't have major hiccups. Very smooth. We submitted what I think it was three offers, yep. and on the third or on the fourth. It, it was the same day that it was listed. We put asking price offer and got it. And then she went in and has made that house look immaculate. Yeah. So, oh yeah, she's great at that. So, but that's basically it for tonight. So go for it. Um, there's one more thing I just thought about uh, with, where was it? Right here. So <clears throat> with this counter offer, um, one thing that they probably will ask on the test, because it's something that I remember, that's why I thought about it, it's something I got on my test. After a counter offer has been, if, if Justin sends me an offer of 200,000, and I say, no, how about 250? If he says, no, I can't go, okay, well, and I accept your 200. You can't accept, once I send a counter offer, the original yeah. offer disappears, it's gone. Like there's, you can't go back and accept it, it it's, it's deleted. Because um, I, I do remember a question like that where they said, you know, basically that, that situation, somebody sends an offer, they counter it, they say no, can you go back and accept the original offer? 
And so that's one thing I just wanted to point out about counter offers because I just one other offer. one to add into it. I'm glad you brought that up. One other one. So for example, say that uh, say that Giovanni, you send me a contract for your client. He sends it to me and I get it. And Miss Vita, you're my client, and I say, Miss Vita, here's a contract from Giovanni. You go through it and you're like, well, I wonder if they would take 250 or if they would give me 250. Can you call them and just ask them if they would give 250? What is that called, Travis, if I do that? If I call Giovanni and say, you know, my client wants to, to wants to know, would y'all's client go up to 250? Guess what it's called? It's a counter. Because what I've just done is, is my client did not accept the terms as is and is wanting more money. Yeah. You see how this works. So it is a counter offer, which now means that Giovanni can say no. And by the way, we're dropping our price to, you know, 240. Yeah. Instead of 245, we're dropping it to 240. Okay. So you have to advise your client. And they say, well, you know, I just am curious. Explain to them that if I do this, don't be surprised if they come back and say, you know what? By the way, I want to go down five thousand because you're asking. We countered, so we're dropping. So you can't retroactively go back after you've declined. You would have to put in another. You'd have to be a yes, ma'am. Yeah. So overall, everybody online, are y'all doing good? Thumbs up if you're doing good. Honestly. How many of you saying no? Put your thumb down. I got one here. <laughs> Corey, how are you doing? I'm, not doing I'm good. I'm going to go back over the video once it's posted, though, just to kind of clarify on some stuff. But I would recommend, Corey, that I would like everybody to do is listen to the one that I taught previously as well. Not just yeah. tonight, but the one I taught previously. Mm -hmm. Because as a teacher, I can't cover every single thing that I can possibly think of. So you're going to get both, okay? And that's the whole point of me doing these recordings is, is that I'm trying to keep them so that you have plenty of databases that you can go back and listen to, okay? Um, but if, Corey, while you're doing your studies, if you are still confused about something or any of you, please message me. Okay, shoot me an email, or shoot Travis an email, or Stephen, or any of us. We don't mind. Yeah. We don't mind. Now, I will tell you, if you shoot me a message tomorrow or Sunday, <laughs> not going to get a response from me because I'm in the prep course. So oh, I'm going to be oh, well, from I'm 9 to 5, I'm going to be in here talking. I'll so, be out of town, so I'll, I might answer it. <laughs> Travis might. Now, Stephen's at home, so he may he will, might get to you, but I may not get back to you until Monday. Okay, just FYI. Uh, uh, Giovanni, how are you doing? I'm doing well, sir. Understanding everything? Yes, sir. Good. That's good. Uh, McKenna, how are you doing, girl? Good. Understanding everything? Yes, sir. Awesome. Awesome. Letitia, Ms. Goldman, how are you? I'm doing okay. I want to go back over the over everything as well. Awesome. Awesome. And Sheldon, how are you doing, Madam? Where do I post complaints? Post complaints? <laughs> uh, we have a CPA. I have I have we have, a we have a CPA. No, actually I've got I've got a place. Okay. Uh, you just have to I've got a, a spot you just slide it through my door. It goes into a shredder and uh and that's where you put them. I believe <laughs> I'll keep note. I'll keep note. Email Stephen Grossman at Noble Realty Group. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. 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 I have to say, I actually am enjoying y'all. The class is good. I'm enjoying it. Y'all seem to be learning. Y'all are interacting, and that's what makes these classes good. And uh, again, remember, this is one week of a 12 week process. So if there's something on these slides, like honestly, every I missed this whole two week class because I was in Dallas the last time he was teaching this course. I've seen all of this in the other classes I was sitting in. So if you're kind of stuck on something or something seems a little bit confusing or whatever, you can always email us. We, you know, we'll get back to you whenever we can. But we are gonna 
again, I've seen all of this in other courses, so we will go over the time. Yeah. It's yeah, a big, yeah. they, they flood you with information and then they yeah. kind of reaffirm it as you go through the courses. So you'll go through this all more in detail and get a better handle of it. That's What's right. going to happen is think of it this way, okay? I always tell people, think of it as a puzzle, okay? You just dump the puzzle out. This is your first week. You dump the puzzle out. Yeah. When you finish this class, you'll end up, you may have the outline of the puzzle, the outside. Of it. Yeah. Then as you take the next class, you'll start building in the middle. Then you'll eventually get to the next one. You'll build a little more and you build a little more. And then when you get to the principles, you're going to have a little of them sitting over here on the side that you're still not sure about. And principles wraps it all back together so you can finally put those pieces in the puzzle. Once you've done it, you'll have the puzzle done. You'll see the big picture. Then we do the prep course, and that's when we're basically hanging that picture on the wall. You've got it. You understand. Okay. So don't think if you feel every time, like last class, last yeah. time we did this, all the students were like, oh my God, this is a ton of information. How am I going to keep up? It is. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Because you're going, to, you're going to see this over and over and over to a point that you're eventually going to be like, now it makes sense. And those light bulbs are going to start popping. Okay. But if you're ever unsure or you're reading or you're looking at this or whatever, we're going to help put those together. That's what our jobs are. Our job is to help put that together so you see the and bigger the, picture. The next course will help a lot because we'll actually yes. put it more into practice going through the actual like how we went through the actual that you know chapter paragraph three of the contract that we'll go through yeah. all the paragraphs. It'll be easier once you kind of can put everything in place and you'll see kind of how to understand it, it in practice a little bit more better. So and we actually in the next class, that's why I like him teaching it, we actually will do hypotheticals. Yeah. So you're gonna have here's the facts, now do it. And you're actually gonna have to do it. Okay. So that's gonna be some of them, and we're actually gonna go through and fill out contracts. So you're actually gonna see us fill out contracts. So that'll be the next one as well on that one. Uh, other than that, I have nothing else. Do you have anything? You good? Yep. Any students? Any of y'all got So questions? you plan to start on Monday? No, you? so we'll finish. Oh. We got one more week in this one. Oh, okay. Then, then we'll start the next class, but you will have that third week to do all of your assignments and everything. Yeah. Then we will set up a time for the exam, which has to be proctored. So we will set a time up with that. Well, we will do the exam by proctor, but the exam will be online, but you'll be proctored through Zoom. Okay, okay. so we will we'll proctor y'all through Zoom, so y'all can be at home and end up take your test. But what we're going to do instead of like last time, it just didn't work. We're going to have it all at one time. We're going to set a date and time for that test. Yeah, cool. And everybody's <laughs> going to sign into Zoom, and y'all going to take the test. Now you're more than welcome to come up here and take your test. We've done that before. You can be at home and take the test, but it. Wherever you want to be is fine. We'll set you up. I think I don't know the company. Whatever works. Yeah. We can get you set up and get you going. Um, but again, we will. That has the finals have to be proctored. So, uh, and then after that, we'll be good from there. So, other than that, any questions online? Everybody good? Everybody good? Uh, I'm gonna let everybody go. I need to talk to Miss Coleman. If I'm correct, is that right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to talk to Ms. Coleman and everybody else. Y'all are good. Y'all are done. So enjoy your weekend and I'll see you all Monday.